If you'll open your Bibles to Daniel, we're going to be uh, we're going to be reading Daniel seven nine through ten. Daniel seven nine and ten. <clears throat> I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Nice to see everyone here this morning. It's nice to realize that we can still assemble in peace. We still have a constitution that protects your right and mine to assemble freely on the Sabbath. I only heard one amen. <laughs> We need to appreciate that because soon that will not be true. I know that many of you are watching the events around you. And I know that you realize that the things that we have been talking about and preaching about and telling others about for years and printing books about they're beginning to happen. And uh, <clears throat> we will need an experience with God that perhaps we don't have now. You know, in the parable of the ten virgins, how many of them fell asleep? They all fell asleep. What was it that awakened the ten virgins? Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Soon, that announcement will be made. And all of the virgins are going to awaken. And some of us will be wise, but some of us will be foolish. And so, it behooves us now to be among the wise, to prepare, to receive the Holy Spirit daily, how often? Daily. Daily. That is the preparation. That is the preparation. Now we're going to talk about the judgment. And you know, usually when you say the word judgment, especially the judgment of God, what do people feel? Usually it's fear. Is that not true? Most people fear the judgment. But as we will discover, that's not a biblical doctrine, to fear the judgment. We're to fear God, <laughs> but not the judgment, because the judgment is good news. And we're going to discover that this morning, or perhaps you know already, but we will find the biblical evidence for the fact that the judgment truly is good news. But before we begin, of course, we want to pray that God will send his spirit to enlighten us and to give us understanding and wisdom. Because what we learn today, or what we're able to confirm today, will be important for you to be able to share with someone very soon. 
to help them to realize that the judgment is good news. So let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to guide our minds as we study together and to help us to understand and share it. <clears throat> Dear Lord, our, <clears throat> our Father in heaven, we bow before you, we humble our hearts before your throne of grace. We thank you, Lord, for the bright, beautiful Sabbath that you have given us and that we can still assemble in peace. We thank you for the protections of our, our great country. And we pray now that as we study your word, that you would grant us, Lord, forgiveness of our sins and our mistakes. And we pray that you would cleanse our hearts and our minds so that we may rightly understand your word. We pray that you would give us your sweet spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of our Redeemer, Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. The biblical account of the opening of the books of God and the investigation of our records in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, our understanding of the judgment is unique in Christianity. And one of the reasons for that is that we believe in an investigative judgment. And most evangelicals uh, do not believe that. In fact, they think we're all wet. They uh, believe that that is not supported by scripture. So my question to you is if someone, particularly an evangelical, said to you, there is no investigative judgment in heaven and there really is no sanctuary in heaven, how would you respond? How would you respond? <clears throat> Remember, Seventh-day Adventists are people of the book. Which book? Bible. This one. Old and New Testament, together, all of it. Not some of it. All of it. How would you respond? What would you say to that person to indicate that there is a judgment there is a sanctuary in heaven and that God plans to investigate the records that are there in heaven. How would you respond? What would you say to that person? Where would you point them? Mm -hmm. But there is one book that clearly indicates that there is a judgment in heaven and there is one other book that also clearly indicates that there is a sanctuary in heaven. Those two books are important for us to remember and to understand. The first book, of course, is the book of the book of Daniel. Daniel. Absolutely. Daniel 7. We just read it. It talks about thrones being put in place. Daniel 7, 9 and 10. So I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to encourage you. I hope you brought your Bible. Where I come from, I come from another culture in the West Indies, and uh, you can always know when it's Sabbath morning because on the country road, you see people all dressed up. And back there, they wear hats, you know. And uh, they always have something tucked under their arm. And you know what that something is? It's a Bible, because they're going to church. <laughs> it used to be that uh, in Jamaica, one out of eight people was a Seventh-day Adventist. That's a huge penetration. I think only Brazil has a larger penetration of Seventh-day Adventists these days. 
But um, that book was something that our people really studied. And I hope you are studying it. Daniel is the book, chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Give us the information we need about the judgment. Notice what it says. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. Who's that? God the Father. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne, where is this? taking place in heaven. That's where God's throne is, isn't it? Isn't it? His throne was a fiery furnace, fr fiery flame, I'm sorry. Its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered to him. 10,000 times, 10,000 stood before him. Is this a large assembly? Very large assembly. The court. The what? The court. There's a court in heaven. Hello? <laughs> There's a court in heaven. The court was seated and the books were open. Someone says to you, there's no investigation of our lives and our records. You point them to Daniel 7. Daniel 7 is the definitive exposition of an investigative judgment. Amen. It's Bible. It's not conjecture. It's not Ellen G. White. Even though we believe that she was the prophet to the remnant church, it's Bible. That's what you have in common with an evangelical or a Catholic the Bible, and it says there is a judgment. And it says that there is a court, and what else is in that court? An examination of evidence. If you have a court, don't you have to have examination of evidence? The books were opened. Now what's in those books? The evidence, absolutely. Go with me to, uh, again, I wasn't even going to do this, but uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's important. <clears throat> the Lord is impressing me that it's important. Um, so go with me to uh, Revelation 20. And I want you to see something there as to what's in those books. Notice. And I saw verse 12 of Revelation 20. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing where? Before God. And books were opened. See there, again, it tells us about books. What's in the books? Notice. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. So we have a, a distinction between the book of life and books. What's in the books? Notice. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were, come on, written in the books. So when Daniel says, the books were opened, what's being opened? The evidence, the evidence is being examined. So as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, you need to be sure of what you believe. Daniel 7 is the evidence that there is an investigative judgment in heaven and that there is evidence, there is a court, 
right? Didn't they say there was a court? And there was what else? Books, evidence. That's the definitive evidence that there is a judgment, an investigation in heaven. Now, back to the question before, <clears throat> or the comment. Most people, when they hear judgment, they get a little fearful, nervous. Uh, usually when you and I stand in a court of law, you know things can go either way, right? And so sometimes we get a little nervous. But this morning we're going to find out something about the evidence and also your attorney. Did you know that you're going to have an attorney Hallelujah. up there? There's an attorney. And we'll find out who the attorney is in a few minutes. But I want you to notice now something, a familiar text of scripture, and it says this, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the, what kind of gospel? Everlasting, Everlasting gospel. Now, we're, we're going to stop there because Every Christian knows that the word gospel means what? Good news. But this is not just good news. It's everlasting good news. And the angel says, fear God, give glory to him. And it gives a reason why we are to fear God and give glory to him. What's the reason? For the hour of his judgment is coming. No, it says has come. What is that saying? It's saying that the judgment is everlasting good news. Are you listening this morning? Everlasting good news. It's gospel, it's good news. How can it be good news? Well, as we progress, we will see. Everlasting good news. Now you'll notice that fear God, give glory to him, worship him. These are not just declarations. What are they? They're commands, exactly. How many commands are there in that verse? How many? Look carefully. How many commands? There's fear God. There's give him glory, and there's what? Worship. There are three commands in the everlasting good news. And it's gospel. Huh. Now, the Apostle Peter says something very interesting. He says, for the time has come for judgment to begin where? at the house of God. What does that mean? Right here, his people. The house of God, all right? And if it begins with us, what's the next word? First, you see there are two judgments. There's the judgment of God's people in heaven, and then there's the judgment of those who have rejected God. That's a separate judgment. That judgment is enumerated in Revelation 20, where we just read the dead standing before the throne of God. Two judgments. So the first judgment, according to Peter, begins with the house of God, the people who have accepted Jesus Christ into the heart and who is now in control of the life of the receiver. All right? The first judgment. Now, Peter says, if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not 
do not obey the gospel of God. Is Peter telling us that the gospel needs to be obeyed? Yes, because there are three commands. Isn't that correct? There are three commands in the everlasting good news. Fear God, give him glory, and it gives a reason. The hour of his judgment has come, and worship him. Three commands. And Peter says, what's going to happen to those who do not obey the everlasting good news gospel? So he's making a comparison between those who are willing to keep the commandments of God. Huh? Aren't they commandments? Yes. Who are willing to keep the commandments of God and those who are not willing to fear him, to give him glory, and to worship him as the creator. You know, lots of people are worshiping God today, but not as the creator. That language that we looked at, the one who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water, direct quote from where? The fourth commandment. If you go to Exodus and you read the reasons for keeping the Sabbath and worshiping God on the Sabbath, the only commandment that said remember, you will see that line in there. Worship um, uh, heaven, earth, sea, and springs of waters or fountains of waters. It's a direct quote from the fourth commandment. So we have three commandments in the everlasting good news gospel. And the people of God, in Revelation 14, it says, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Or 1217 says, the testimony of Jesus. So, that's interesting, isn't it? The everlasting good news requires obedience. Three commands. All right. Now, we looked at this. The court was seated. The books were open. And I hope that you will remember this passage. Again, this is Daniel 7, 9 and 10. Write it down, make sure you have it in your memory because you are going to be challenged on this point. You're going to be challenged and you need to know where it is. By the way, if they said to you, if some evangelical said to you, look, you Seventh-day Adventists are all wet. Sanctuary in heaven, are you kidding? You must be joking, right? and they start to ridicule you, how would you respond? Where would you point that person? Yeah. Hebrews 8, thank you. So there are two places in scripture that you need to know, without question. You need to know that Daniel 7 says there's a judgment in heaven, verses nine and 10, and you need to know that Hebrews 8, go with me now to Hebrews 8. Again, this is something that I believe you should commit to memory, these two Passages of scripture, you should commit to memory. Now, Hebrews 8, <clears throat> let's find it here. Hebrews 8, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. Who's writing the book of Hebrews? Who's the author? We believe that it's the Apostle Paul, but of course it's the Holy Spirit, right? Working through the Apostle. The language seems to indicate that it's the Apostle Paul. And it says this, now this is the main point of the things that we are saying. We have such a high priest who is at, seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Who's that high priest? Who does? Who does it identify as the high priest? Jesus, right? Now notice, <clears throat> verse two. 
a minister of the sanctuary of the, what kind of tabernacle? The true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. That is the definitive verse in scripture that tells us there is a sanctuary in heaven. And you don't have to bow down to people who are telling you differently because you have the Bible. What do you have? This book, the Bible. You don't have to quote the spirit of prophecy. You don't have to quote Max Lucado or some other evangelical. You quote the Bible. It's, it's Bible. That's what we have in common with our fellow Protestants. And soon there will be a call by that mighty angel that comes down from heaven and says, Babylon is fallen. And soon there will be a voice, another voice, not the voice of the angel, another voice that says, come out of her, my people. He's going to call them out. And where is he calling them out of? The answer is Babylon. Absolutely. Confusion. So Daniel 7 and Hebrews 8, keep that in mind because that is how we can defend ourselves against those who say there's no investigative judgment and there's no sanctuary in heaven. Now, Solomon writing under the influence of the Holy Spirit, talks about the judgment. And he says this, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Fear God? Yes. But now notice what he says. Instead of give glory to him, it says fear God and keep his commandments. Do you suppose that giving glory to him has something to do with honoring his commandments? Amen. That they're synonymous? Notice, fear God and keep his commandments because this is the whole duty of man. Now notice what he says next. For God shall bring every work into judgment. Didn't? that first angel say the reason that we fear God and give glory to him was that the hour of his see here it is again the same words but in the Old Testament when did Solomon write about a thousand years before Jesus but here a thousand years before Jesus we have the same sequence The same spirit inspired Solomon. That's why you have the same sequence. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So there is a judgment, but that judgment is good news by definition from Revelation 14. Now, <clears throat> Jesus said in Revelation 22, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. To give every man according to his work shall be. So if he's coming quickly and his reward is with him, then somehow that reward must have been considered in the light of the judgment because the reward could not be with him unless a decree had been given to the person who receives the reward, Amen. right? Second Corinthians five, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, when do we actually stand before the judgment seat of Christ? 
apparently in heaven there is an investigation but are you there in person when that's happening the answer is no you're not but there is an execution of the judgment and that's found in Matthew 25 so go with me to Matthew 25 and let's look at the execution of the judgment because in verse 31 of Matthew 25 we find the following starting with verse 31 do you have your Bible starting in verse 31 it says when the Son of Man comes in all his glory and all the holy angels with him what's that describing the second coming of Christ, right? Notice. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Now notice what he says next. All the nations will be gathered where? Where? Before him. Didn't Paul just tell us we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ? This is the execution of the decision that was made in the court. Are you listening? Notice. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will, now notice, what's the next word? He will separate them. He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Then he will set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And of course, they ask him, when did we see you sick? or in need of food or clothing and minister and what, what's his answer? If you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, who does he call the prisoner and those who don't have any food? He calls them my brethren. He says, if you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. Now some people would read that and say, oh, that's salvation by works. Uh, no. No, it's salvation by grace, and that grace has produced a character. Are you listening? That grace has produced a character, and that character is a character of love and compassion. The fruit is on the tree. Love, joy, peace, right? All the fruit of the Spirit, goodness, meekness. Oh, that meekness one, I'll tell you, I'm having, a, I'm having some trouble, folks. I'm not the meek person I should be. Somebody says something and I want to fight, you know, right? Come on, it's Sabbath, tell the truth. You're like that too, right? You want to fight. But the fruit needs to be on the tree. Meekness, gentleness, faith. And the last one is self-control. Oh my, to have the self-control of the Holy Spirit. What a blessing. But that fruit needs to be on the tree also. So this is not salvation by works. This is salvation by grace. 
that develops a character that is loving and kind and generous and forgiving. That's what this is talking about, the character of Jesus. And that is what the judgment is all about. Do you have the compassion of Jesus, the love? Or do you have the character of the enemy, selfish, self-serving? That's what will determine where we will spend eternity. Have the graces of the Holy Spirit develop compassion in your heart and mine. One of the most wonderful experiences I've ever had as a Christian. I was a new Christian. And I was working for a, a television station in Buffalo, New York. And uh, <clears throat> I came out of the station. I was going to lunch. And there was an old woman coming down the sidewalk. And I could tell that she was homeless. And you know, new Christians really are sensitive to the needs of others. Have you noticed? They tend to be very sensitive. We get older and, you know, we kind of make excuses. Well, let the government take care of those people. I don't need it, right? Come on. But she was coming down the sidewalk and I saw that she was in need. I sensed it. Don't ask me how I sensed it. I just did. <laughs> You know, the Holy Spirit talks to you, right? And uh, <laughs> I stuck my hand in my pocket and I pulled out a few dollars, I don't remember. And I said to her, have you had breakfast yet? And she said, she looked up on me, they looked on me and she said, no. And I gave her the money. The woman looked at the bunny. Her eyes lit up like a Christmas tree and she ran down the sidewalk crying. I have never had anything like that happen in my life. I still remember it. This is what Jesus wants us to do. And I don't care who tells you what. But we are to have compassion on those around us. And I'm not telling you that story to tell you that I'm any better than you because there are times when I've ignored people. I'm, I'm not going to tell you about all the times that I ignored people, okay? But that was an experience that I will always remember. God is going to separate the loving from the selfish, the compassionate from the self-seeking. And that's how we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's the executive phase of the judgment. But the investigative phase, the court is seated where? In heaven. In heaven. And you and I, by the grace of God, the graces of the Holy Spirit. How does uh, Christ object lesson put it? The graces of the Spirit will ripen your character. Didn't Revelation 14 say, the harvest of the earth is ripe? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the love and compassion of Jesus in the heart and mind. And that makes us ready to be declared righteous by faith. Righteous forever. Now I want you to notice something about, I, I've, I've totally ignored my slide presentation because I'm just talking from what the Holy Spirit is giving me here this morning. I want you to, I want you to notice something else. 
in Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Let's go back to chapter 7. In chapter 7, we see a little horn power mentioned. Now, who is this little horn power? Well, all of the early reformers, I'm talking about Protestant reformers now, I'm talking about Luther, I'm talking about Huss and Jerome and Calvin and Zwingli, all of them identified that little horn as the papacy. Now, in Daniel 7 and verse um, 25, we find the following. It says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High and shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and laws. And then it says, Then... The saints shall be given into his hand for how long? A time and times and the dividing of times. And all uh, Protestant Bible scholars have translated that to be 1260, not all of them, but most of them, 1260 years, the period of papal supremacy. But there are two things in Daniel chapter 7 that I want you to notice concerning the judgment. Two other things. The first was verses 9 and 10 that tells us that there is an investigation. There's a court and there's evidence. And there's a large gathering of people. And there are thrones that are set down. Which probably means the jury, although it doesn't say that. But notice that this little horn power in verse 21, I was watching, and the same horn was making war against who? Against the saints. And notice, prevailing against them. So he's tearing up God's people. And he did that for 1260 years. However, in the time of the judgment, something happens, and I want you to notice what happens to the little horn as a result of the judgment. Notice, he was prevailing against them, verse 22. What does it say? There's a very important word there. It says, until. Uh-huh, he got it. Hallelujah is right. Until what? The Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints. Now we're talking good news, right? He's prevailing for a while, but what stops the little horn power in the end of time? The answer is the judgment. The judgment is what stops him. The court sits, and his power is taken away. Notice verse 26. But the court shall be seated, and they, who's the they? The court. And they shall, notice, take away his dominion to consume and destroy it for how long? Forever, unto the end. What is it that stops the little horn power in the end of time? The judgment stops him. Is it good news? Yes. The judgment is good news. Because God's people in the judgment are placed forever beyond the reach of Satan. Are you listening? God's people are placed forever beyond the reach of the enemy. The judgment is good news. And as long as you are praying when you get down on your knees in the morning, and I hope you are, I hope you're making time to get down on your knees and say to the Lord, Lord, take charge of me today. 
Give me that love, that grace, that forgiveness in my heart toward others. Give me your character. I want to partake of the divine nature. As Peter says, if you're praying that prayer and you're asking God to take charge of you and your character, you will be declared righteous by faith in the judgment. No matter how weak you are, no matter what kind of faults you may have, God looks at the character of Jesus. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's what the Bible says. And so you, as you are praying for the character of Jesus to be manifested in your heart and life for that day, you are accounted righteous in the judgment. Can you say amen this morning? Amen. God is merciful and he is in the business of transferring his love and joy and peace, goodness and faith and self-control to his people, to the hearts and minds of his people. The judgment is good news. Well, my time's gone, and uh, I think I'm up to slide four. So we'll have to have part two. Uh, <laughs> part two, uh, who knows, a month from now, but we will continue our discussion of the judgment and uh, the good news that God is going to transfer his character to his people. Let's pray. <clears throat> our dear Lord, our Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we have your word to guide us, to help us to understand the good news of your judgment, that soon we will be placed forever beyond the reach of the enemy. And Lord, we pray this day that as we go from day to day, that you will transfer, impart to us your divine nature, that love, that joy, that peace. Lord, we want to be loving and kind and generous and forgiving. Bless us to that end, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.